Okay, um, I think we'll make a start. Um, hello everyone, uh, welcome to another one of the Landscapes Live uh, seminar uh, seminars. Um, really great to see how many people are coming today and I'm noticing more people are coming in uh, with each second, so that's fantastic. Um, so today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Wolfgang and um, he's going to talk about his recent work looking at uh, trouble with transients, the shared stream power model uh, in rejuvenating landscapes. So as usual, for those of you who haven't attended a Landscapes Live seminar before, Wolfgang will talk for about 30 to 40 minutes um, and then we will open up um, the room for questions. So please post your questions um, to the Zoom chat um, and we'll moderate those um, moving forward. Um, we are also trying trialing um, something new with Discord. So if you would like to continue with the discussions um, after the session, uh, Wolfgang has kindly agreed to um, interact with um, our Landscapes Live Discord server. Um, and hopefully Rita will post the details of how you can access that um, in the chat in just a second. Uh, just for everyone's, uh, just so everyone's aware, this, uh, this uh, talk is being recorded. Okay, so if you don't feel comfortable being featured, please turn off your uh, videos uh, now. Um, okay, uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Wolfgang. Thank you very much. And, and please begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. Well, I'm ready. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth, for the introduction. And um, also, thank you for having me here. Um, it's really great to see more than eight people <coughs> attending, uh, which underscores the really the success of landscape lives. Um, over well these couple of years and one of the few good things that came out of COVID right um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, about transient landscapes and the trouble that we have with them um, when we use the stream power model um, and I'd like also to show that um, the shared stream power model um, provides quite some yeah possible pathway to deal with uh, these these problems um, now, the work that I'm going to present is, let me see, okay, um, is not just work that I've done myself in the last um, month. I've discussed with uh, Steffi Tufeld and um, conceptualized with her that research, uh, but also Alexa Pietrek, Dirk Scherler, Andreas Ludwig, Angela Landgraf, and Stefan Hergarten have been part of this. Okay, um, so one of the backgrounds probably that most of you have um, and I mean a lot of it was basically also um, yeah covered in various lectures here on landscapes live um, is the stream power incision model right we we use it a lot um, for those who have not used it before and who are not so familiar I have just a few slides that basically give you a short introduction um, so the stream power incision model is certainly one of the cornerstones of quantitative geomorphology. Um, it describes how the elevation of a river changes over time as a function of the uplift rate and river incision. Now, river incision is modeled from the upslope area, um, a proxy for discharge, slope, and K, which is the erosive efficiency parameter. That includes bedrock erodibility, but also other factors that reflect erosivity. Now, the formulation here is for the 1D case, but we can easily apply it to 2D as well. For example, the figure here on the right um, side shows a landscape simulated uh, with this model. And I, I'm always fascinated by how well it actually works. Um, now, we can make it work or seem unrealistic if we impose some extra uplift and you will see how basically this landscape changes in response to an uplifting block in the center of this uh, model domain. Okay, so one of the great things about the stream power incision model is that we can infer its parameters um, from digital elevation models, in short DEMs. And um, here we may differentiate um, two guiding principles, actually. The first one is, like on the left-hand side, steady state. That means uplift and incision are in perfect balance. In fact, this is an assumption that probably rarely holds, but it's a very good working hypothesis and a very convenient one, of course. Um, the second condition is transient response. 
That means the landscape reacts to some external perturbation, for example, a base level drop, and then adjusts to it, usually by incision and then the formation of so-called nick points along the river profile. Now, if we assume steady state, we can rearrange the terms um, and solve for river gradient. Um, this is shown here. If we solve for d set over dx, um, well, we can basically have a good explanation why rivers are upstream concave. Um, now, in the next step, we can integrate both sides in this steady state equation. Um, and um, yeah, then have on the left hand side, the set over the X uh, integrated over the X. So in upstream direction, well, what's that? Well, that's basically set. Uh, so the elevation itself. And on the right hand side, well, we have the integration constant plus a term that includes uplift, erodibility, um, some, some reference area to the exponent of one over N, as well as chi. And chi, uh, well, it's in, since I think the seminal paper by uh, Perrin and Royden, um, it is used a lot. Um, it linearizes the, or, the, or chi basically is a transformation of the horizontal coordinate, uh, which linearizes the concave output profile to a straight line. So what we have basically here is that set is described as a linear function of chi. And that makes things, of course, a lot more convenient than to work with. Now, how can we then infer K from steady and transient landscapes? So K is a, a crucial, uh, let's say, a key parameter in um, the uh, um, stream power incision model. Well, in steady state landscapes, um, when we assume that, well, M can be derived from steady state profiles, um, N as well. And if uplift, for example, is same as basin-wide denudation, and we have either uplift or basin-wide denudation rates, we can actually infer K. So the let's call it just erodibility, even though it's more than that. Um, on the other hand, if we have transient landscapes, we can make use of chi. Uh, because the good thing is that not only you know, rivers become a straight line if they are steady state, if there are perturbations to the river and we have the formation of nick points that travel upstream uh, by a headwater incision, that means that in chi space, they all cluster at the same value of chi. Um, that only holds if we have n equal one. Um, and same erodibility and uplift and climate and so forth. Um, but then the time required for nick points to travel to some specific location in chi can actually be calculated um, by, or let's say to, to where they travel, it can be also involved by taking tau into constant. So tau is kind of the response time that is required for nick points to travel to that particular location in chi. Um, and well, if we know tau, so the time of incision, that gives us also a possibility to constrain k. Now, in an ideal world, both approaches should actually give us the same values. Um, well, because they are actually um, based on the same theory. However, if we take a look at a global compilation um, of both basin-wide denudation rates, as well as um, nick point retreat rates, and we infer for all of those k, um, then a different picture appears actually. So just to guide you through that uh, figure, um, the red dots are basin-wide denudation rates, which I thankfully got from Maria Lise Harrell, Simon Mudd, and uh, Mikhail Atal, and which I'm presenting here then in a slightly uh, let's say, um, reanalyzed form. Um, now, those basically plot as a function, at, appear as a function of m equals 0 0.5, but as a function of integration time. Of course, when we determine those values, integration time is already within that calculation, but it just shows that we have that strong relation here. 
um, which we also see in nick point uh, retreat rates and actually in the value of k when we retrieve it from uh, nick points and that also shows that uh, we have a power law function power law decay of nick point speed basically over integration time um, but in the end there's a, a great offset of two orders even up to three orders of magnitude between those k values well that k basically plots on all that line there there might be an explanation for that um, it's likely not observed in the upper part in the upper right hand part because if they are that fast over such time scales then they probably have left the system um, but on the other hand why are they not located on the lower left that might also be just an observation bias because if we have such lands, uh, such nick points, it will be difficult to detect that they are actually moving. They might be classified as stationary nick points. Okay, so still we need to resolve that um, offset that we see here. And what I'd like to do and try to do that is um, that we, yeah, come up with a couple of assumptions and hypotheses to do that. Um, now, we might say, okay, the stream power model is, just doesn't work. Um, no, I would say that uh, the stream power model actually works, um, but that, and that river profiles evolve through the action of stream power, okay? But uh, rivers incise into bedrock and need to transport sediments. That means they share their power to do both. Now that assumption um, is for, steady state rivers that have to excavate the material that comes from upstream and from hill slopes. At nick points, the picture might be a little bit different because we have a very sparse bad cover usually here, which might warrant a purely detachment limited model for their retreat. Now, <clears throat> the contrast between these K values can be perhaps ascribed to the different proportions spent by rivers for detachment and transport. Now, the good thing is that in order to test these, this hypothesis, uh, we have a new tool at hand, which is called the shared stream power model, which has been written by, by Stefan Hergarten, um, based on work also on prior work um, by um, Davi and, and Lark, um, as well as Whipple and Tucker, uh, Yuan also. Um, so, but what it basically does is that it states that the stream power is shared among detachment and transportation. And at the same time, well, we need to dis, uh, maintain a mass balance so that uplift equals the change in elevation bed. Um, um, and that there is also sediment flux included, which is basically the integral of the erosion <coughs> happening in the upstream area of each location. Now that stream power shared among detachment and transport, that, and that is encapsulated in two, two main components or uh, parameters, which is KD and KT. And KD is basically the bedrock of erodibility and KT, the ability to transport. So remember those two um, abbreviations. Okay, the other thing that we need is, um, at best a study site where we can test this model okay so the previous compilation that i've showed uh, well those are data that have been retrieved all over the world but certainly not or rarely at the same location um so we're going to a place uh, which is called um, the butach or the butach catchment the butach is in southern or southwestern germany it is a river that nowadays drains to the Rhine and then to the North Sea, but it did not do so always. Uh, about 18,000 years ago, it uh, drained towards the Danube, uh, so to the, towards the Black Sea. Um, now, had we incision of the old Wuta, basically, um, um, led to a yeah, capture of the Wuta and and in the wake of that capture, of course, also the river um, incised a lot, but actually um, more than 170 years ago. So remember the deflection took place at about 18,000 years ago. 
And what we see as, as in one of the remnants today, well, is that quite prominent deflection knee at the point or at the location of capture. Now, just to give you an idea how that area looks like today, um, this is the Wouter yeah, um, Gorge, um, as well as, for example, like here, these, this frozen waterfall presents one of the prominent waterfalls um, that uh, can be found uh, just along the entire stretch of the gorge. Okay, now, how can we learn about different parameters? Now, um, the first thing that we'd like to do is um, that we infer KD from nick point locations. Okay, so far, what we have, we have time. Um, so when did the actual incision happen? So 18,000 years ago. Otherwise, well, the rest is something that we need to retrieve from um, the DEM data. Now, um, what I've been working on in the last couple of months and even years is um, to conceptualize that problem of identifying and, and analyzing nick points that I conceptualize nick points as stochastic spatial point pattern on stream networks. So for example, if you have a completely spatial random pattern, that might be one, that would mean that a dependence of chi, so the transformed horizontal variable that I just introduced, that then, well, they basically plot randomly all over the place. Okay, so there is no pattern seeable from this um, you know, kind of kernel density estimator, which is normalized by the occurrence of chi itself. Now, the nick point patterns at the Wutach, they have a very different pattern from the purely random pattern. Okay, so they show that peak of occurrence in a relatively narrow range of chi values. Um, and well, when we have such, oops, let's go back. Um, when we have such a pattern, like this shown here again, um, we can actually also fit a model to that pattern. And that model could be a log linear model of nick point dependence on chi um, for one incisional perturbation. That would actually be a log linear model of second order degree. So it's not super important that we understand that here right now, but it's just meaning that I'm trying to describe that intensity curve of nick points by a parametric curve um, that describes this intensity. Because if I have a parametric model, then I can also derive uncertainties and other stuff. Um, so this is basically done by a kind of logistic regression. And when I do that for the nick points in the booter, it returns a KD value of 7.92 to the 10 to the minus five, okay? Also, you know, we can try that for different M values. We can take M 0.6 or so M equals 0.4 and try to find the M values that minimizes basically the scatter of K values. And in fact, the M value is more or less 0.5. So I'm using 0.5 throughout this uh, analysis then. Um, yes. Okay, so how can we infer K from steady state basin? So in the next step, we want to infer K from the, so it's not KT, but K, since we think that river profiles encapsulate both KT and KD, okay? So inferring K from steady state basins, I'm exactly doing that in a way that I described before. And that gives me for, those catchments which we deem to be you know, more or less in steady state, uh, of course, we cannot guarantee that, but at least those catchments that have more or less um, yeah, upward concave profiles without any major nicks, um, well, they return values of like here 4.4 to the minus seven. So actually all of them have K values that are about 10 to the minus seven, okay? So, also, we can do that for all kinds of M values. Um, and, but in the end, for nick points, well, we find K values, which basically plot up here for different M values here. And for all our basins, 10 basins, but variable M, for example, uh, we can find lower M uh, K values. 
with these two orders of magnitude difference that we actually also saw in our global compilation before. Okay, so in our global compilation here on the right hand side, those the Butach nick point data is basically plotted at, as this black dot, whereas the big red dots are the uh, basin white denudation rates. Okay. Um, now the question is, can we consolidate the contrasting K values with the shared stream power model? Um, now, before we do that, let's try to forward model basically the development of the Wutach using the SPIM. Um, so the stream power incision model or the detachment version. Um, now this highlights just a couple of interesting things, but first of all, um, interesting to, or important to note here, on the left-hand side is um, the initial condition of the stream profile that we simulate. You know, we simulated the surface um, and basically the black line here shows these initial conditions. This works quite well for the water, but you, you know, it's un very uncommon that you basically have such good controls for the um, initial condition in landscape evolution models. Okay. So when we run the stream power incision model with the parameter defined by KD, um, and assuming that our initial um, time was 8 in KA, N equals 1, and M0.5, and also that uplift is basically negligible. I mean, it's there is uplift, but there is probably no uplift um, in um, yeah, relative to the outlet of that. 40 kilometer long stretch. Uh, so we just imposed a little bit of uplift here. Now, if we have tau ini, so our initiation of the capture um, to 18,000 years, that would mean 7.9 to the minus five for a value of KD. Uh, alternatively, if we would base our estimates on our 10 beryllium denudation rates, then a gorge like that, like the Wutach gorge, would require 3.4 million years to form. So that's quite an offset, and which gives you hopefully an idea about the importance of the K value here. Okay, but nevertheless, what is also shown here that this is that the SPIM obviously doesn't work in reconstructing the profile, right? It might capture the nick point locations, but it also creates a very flat um, valley bottom. Um, which is at odds, of course, with what we find in the field. Now, a different model that we might want to try, that's the lower left one here, um, is a transport limited model. Yeah, that works much better, um, at least as you know, quantified by the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, um, which, by the way, is negative for the spin. Just saying that if the NSE is less than zero, that means uh, we would be better off with just the mean uh, for um, yeah, evaluating or for predicting these elevations. Um, now the transport limited model works actually quite nicely concerning the NSE. Um, however, it lacks the nicks, the sharp uh, waterfalls that are present in the water. Um, now the final approach that we chose here, the SSPM, the shared stream power model, um, with KD values and KT values um, just determined from nick point locations and basin wide denudation rates um, performs much better. Now let's zoom in a little bit. Um, I mean, it's not just perfect, but um, concerning the shape of that profile, it works pretty much or pretty well. Um, just one important thing here, we determined K based on base and white denudation rates. But from this relation uh, given by Stefan uh, in his, his 2021 paper, we can actually determine uh, KT also. Okay, so we have a pretty good fit between the actual and the model river profile with an NSE of 0 0.92. It's a little bit worse than basically the pure transport limited model, uh, but it captures better some of the features that we see in the field. And in the next step, well, we can even try to make that better. Um, so what we try then is to optimize the stream power, um, the, the shared stream power uh, parameters uh, using Bayesian optimization. 
And that shows uh, basically that with our initial estimates here, we're actually not so bad off. Um, from a optimal value, which is basically pretty close. Now, if you know values or combinations of KT and KD change, then when we go in that direction, we go towards the string power incision model. Um, so then the NSE gets really bad. If we go along the, that direction, uh, then we go towards a, um, a transport limited model. Here, we have a pretty broad optimum within that parameter space. Um, and well, that basically reflects the good fit that we just had already with the transport limited model. Um, so there is a large variability of KD actually that might work. Um, and this could of course also be due to some very heterogeneous lithology. So in the next step, um, we try to incorporate lithology. So in fact, the geology of the Wutach region is highly diverse and comprises mainly east, southeast dipping Mesozoic strata. Um, and indeed, many cliffs and nick points um, along the Wutach are attached to resistant rocks, such as paleozoic crystalline rocks or bank carbonates of the middle Muschelkalk. Hence, what we did, we acquired a 3D lithological map and reconstructed the geology within the Wutach itself and its tributaries. So actually doing this reconstruction could have been a study on its own, but I won't detail it here. Um, so we have a map, a 3D map. And if you look at that uh, of the lithologies, you can also see how these um, lithologies change over uh, along the Wutach River and its reconstructed um, yeah, surface. So, what we needed to do then is that we classified little lithostratigraphic units into erodibility classes. Um, so we defined three erodibility classes. EC1 is highly erodible. EC3 is very resistant to erosion and EC2 is something in between. Note that however, we have no idea about the exact erodibility values. Um, and hence, again, we turn on our optimization machine uh, to do this job for us. Um, this time, however, optimizing for EC1 to EC3, maintaining all other parameters equal. Now, those are the results. Incorporating 3D lithologies, hmm. well, we have an improvement in the NSE. Before it was 0 0.94, now it's 0 0.95, yes. Um, what a great improvement. No, actually, that actually doesn't warrant a, um, yeah, incorporating a higher degree of parametrization of that model. What is interesting, nevertheless, first of all, is that, well, those are the erodibilities, super high erodibilities. Okay, there should be a zero more here uh, for EC2, but super high erodibilities of 10 to the minus two, right? But then EC3 is quite erod uh, less erodible uh, with 10 to the minus five. Um, so was it worth the effort to include um, a 3D lithology? From these numbers and from the final results, probably not. But if we look at the time, how these profiles develop, we can see quite some significant changes. And I just chose some movies so it can lean back and relax. So this one is, for example, shows the Gutach, one of the tributaries. And we can see that with incorporating these lithologies, um, and you see the time runs to 18,000 years, we can match basically the profiles quite well. Um, let's let this run run again. And yep. And the other one, for example, is this one here. It's another smaller tributary um, where incision or where the model basically ends up at a surface that more or less resembles the one that we find in the field, which is shown by the black line. Okay, so what I want to stress here is a, a term that I just came across again after not using it for quite a while, equifinality. So equifinality is the principle that in open systems, a given end state can be reached by many potential means. And so in the end, the one model without lithology works quite well in its end result, 
Um, but the other model basically shows a trajectory which is very different, but ends up also at the same uh, end result. Um, now, those two trajectories are shown here. For the normal stream power, uh, not stream power, shared stream power model, well, we have that kind of retreat here, um, which is more or less constant along the trunk river. Um, and for when we include lithology, well, what happens here is then that we have a super rapid uh, incision at the beginning. So within the first 2000 years, basically, most of the stuff is already eroding and then it slows down it's as soon as the river hits the more resistant bedrock um now it's difficult to assess which of the two is more consistent with reality so there are fortunately a lot of 14c datings of tufa wood and charcoal uh, which however only provide minimum ages of watch formation um so here we might argue that this model here performs a little bit better because, well, we do not overestimate ages like as frequently, but that's a weak argument. Of, I see that here for those two data sets. What is stronger is basically that remnants of strut terraces, which are prevailing at the upper part of the gorge, are much more consistent with the second lith lithology driven model uh, than the one that as assumes a, a homogeneous lithology. So, um, well, incorporating lithology is probably um, quite a good idea. Um, it shows even more that we have a large spread of erodibilities or KD values uh, if we change the, um, or oh, if we include this lithology, if we compare our models basically, and I do this here using Taylor diagrams, so Taylor diagrams are mainly used in metrology to compare models. Um, so the stream power model, the SPIM, stream power incision model, well, that doesn't perform well. It captures the variability actually, but that's because it creates such huge nick points. Um, but otherwise there's a strong, yeah, root mean squared difference. Um, and um, the correlation coefficient is also not very good. The other models, in particular, those that include um, the um, yeah, transport limitation, um, like the shared stream power model and the shared stream power model with the lithology, those are the ones that perform best. Okay, so what can we take from here? Um, there are probably a lot of things to discuss and with every modeling studies, you probably come up with ideas what one should include and what I haven't included. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss this afterwards. But the two things that I'd like to discuss here is, first of all, um, is it actually universal that nick points uh, retreat faster than we would expect from inverting steady state profiles? And um, while I've shown that um, offset for our global compilation, while I've shown that for uh, Buta, it's probably not always the case. For example, when you look at uh, um, DiBiase's uh, um, paper from 2015, which describes waterfalls and waterfall retreat in the uh, Big Tahanga catchment in the um, St. Gabriel Mountains. Um, here they find that um, nick points are much less mobile than would be predicted by um, um, steady state in uh, retrieved K values. Um, and well, and they argue um, that this is mainly because there are also very blocky substrates at the foot of waterfalls and nick points, uh, which inhibit um, that, um, yeah, these uh, yeah, nick points retreat further upstream. Um, the, the contrary can actually also observed. Uh, for example, Mackey and, and Joel Scheinkroes and team um, they observed in Hawaii that nick points retreated much faster because debris flows efficiently um, eroded everything from below uh, the nick point uh, so that the nick point phase was more or less clear. Um, so that just means these are stuff that I, of course, are not included in our model um, and might add to a lot of variability. Um, a lot of variability might also be added by just hydrodynamic um, yeah, or challenges, let's say, uh, that also were described um, before. Um, 
by, by Baines, for example. Um, the other stuff is, or what I, what I want to um, uh, uh, discuss is, is it really so that we have such a dominance of the transport limited model? Now, I said that the shared stream power model is a continuum model between the detachment and the transport limited model. And um, well, we can investigate the degree of um, the importance of each of the processes using the deposition coefficient G, which has been prior introduced by Yuan and Laura Garrett, um, and which is just the, the ratio of KD and KT. Um, now, if G goes towards zero, well, then we get towards the detachment limited model. Whereas when it approaches infinity, it goes towards the transport limited model. And uh, Garrett et al, they argue that, well, like the, the threshold between both is at about 0 0.4. Uh, and they also find a lot of values for G that range mainly in the range from 0 0.2, 0 0.3 up to yeah, one, and even a bit higher to six, but also values that mainly of nearly reach infinity. Now the Vuta is somewhere here in a relatively high range with 116. Okay, so a value it's above 100. Um, and of course we need to ask why is that? Um, well, some possible explanations could be that KD from nick points may actually reflect spatially focused erosion and cannot be actually transferred to lowering rates of entire river systems. However, I think also G itself is quite challenging to obtain from natural landscapes. And so even here, the values in, in uh, Laura Garrett's paper might be affected, for example, by the, um, yeah, by the assumption that there is zero uplift in, in the depositional regions. Um, finally, what a lot of people probably also might argue Hey, what about n greater than one? Um, and yes, that's a point that we didn't discuss so far. It won't probably, or creating values or having values greater than one will probably not um, yeah, dissolve the two, three order magnitude difference between KD and KT. Um, however, some of the profiles might look very much different when we use a stream power incision model, for example, with n equals uh, yeah, or greater than one. So for example, we optimize just uh, for M and N um, and K and then try to reconstruct a profile. Well, it doesn't work much better, one has to say, but okay, one could of course try to do that also for variable lithologies and that's something that I might follow up on um, in the future. Um, so perhaps one important test to see, do these parameter combinations actually fit is just by simulating landscapes themselves. And here, um, yeah, kind of um, difficult to say. Um, so what I'm asking here, are landscapes simulated with our parameter combinations plausible? And the parameter combination of KT and KD uh, is basically shown here. So it would result given a surface, you know, 20 kilometers in X and Y direction, uh, uplift of two millimeters and over 2 million years, that would be the resulting surface. So one which is super strongly impacted by diffusive processes. Now, let's say we just have overestimated G by an order of magnitude and are somewhere around 11. Well, that surface doesn't look too bad. And if we go to 1.16, well, then we effectively erode the landscape quite a lot. Uh, now it goes down to 800 meters, which is a bit low for an uplift rate for two millimeters per year. Okay, so let me conclude um, and uh, yeah, say what, what our main implications are. Um, now we also show as previous studies that natural landscape systems tend to be transport limited or be in transport limit conditions, even in highly erosive settings. The Wuta is highly erosive, actually. We show also that com the combined use of basin-wide denudation rates and nick point analysis offers parameters um, to model transient landscapes. And um, that K values from basin-wide denudation rates 
alone mostly overestimate landscape response times. Um, finally, I think it's super important to include lithologies into these modeling efforts. We show that the dynamic evolution of river profiles is highly affected by spatially variable lithologies. And yeah, with that, I'd like to thank you. I particularly like to thank the NAGRA, the National Cooperative for the Disposal of Radioactive Waste, uh, which supported this study a lot. So thanks a lot. And um, I'm looking forward to receiving your questions. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. That was a really great talk. Um, thank you very much. Uh, really cool insights. Um, so uh, just for everyone's, uh, just to let everyone know, um, the chat is now open. So please feel free to post your questions. If you do, would prefer to ask a question uh, um, verbally, then please raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, so while everyone's maybe thinking about what questions they might like to ask Wolfgang, uh, and again, I should remind everybody that we do have the Discord server. So if you do think of questions at a later date that you'd like to ask him, uh, he'll monitor that for a few, uh, about 24 hours after this talk. So please post your questions there as well. Um, so yeah, before perhaps everybody else maybe post their questions, I have a, a sort of quite a simple one, if that's okay. Um, I'm just interested to, know a little bit more about what the size of the nick points are in your model and i'm not talking about vertical size i'm talking about how much of your long profile for example are these nick points um and how do they how might they vary perhaps in your landscape but also between landscapes um i'm just interested that you spoke about nick points as opposed to nick zones and i'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit there thank you yeah absolutely so um the Nick zones are probably up to a couple of hundred meters long, um, but that highly depends on whether we are along the trunk stream where they are much longer than compared to the um, tributaries. Um, and in, in small tributaries, we have pretty high, very steep and very more waterfall type uh, Nick points, um, often given by lithological contrasts, of course. Um, but also in line with the modeling itself, that um, often nick points steepen as soon as they enter um, tributaries. And yeah, so these are about the values. Uh, for, in concerning height, uh, differs up to yeah, a few, few meters to more than yeah, 20, 20 meters or so. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, so we have one um, here from Daniel Shelby. Uh, they ask, can you please describe the methods you've used to calculate stream power? Did you measure channel dimensions in situ or use GIS satellite photos? Are there gauges on the river that you measure or are flows estimated from weather patterns? Oh, excellent question. Um, uh, actually, none of these. <laughs> it's all based on uh, digital elevation models. Uh, I think I even didn't even look at uh, discharge values, um, nor did we try to constrain river width, for example. We just used the stream power model as it is uh, used in its simplest form, um, where all those parameters are basically encapsulated in its uh, in these crude parameters, k, m, and n. Great. So do we have any other question? Anything else? Nope. Okay, can I make a question? A very simple one. <laughs> have you tried to, to test it in other basins or this is the first attempt that you made? That's the first attempt that we made. Um, I can envision to apply it also to other regions. Um, it's just that we should have ideally both. So um, either retreat, uh, nick point retreat rates or that we know exactly when um, base level drop occurred as well as basin wide denudation rates. So if you have any of that study sites uh, or know of any, then uh, please let me know. Great, I think we have another question from Lorenzo, which is asking if um, you know about the impact of the initial velocity on your study, case river on its erosion capacity, specifically in relation to the river's response to change in base level or rock variability. In other words, 
cannot be that you see high incision when the river captures happen and then decrease the velocity independently of the lithology or have he missed something in the middle of the presentation? Uh, wait, I, I just read that through. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's I, not a... <laughs> study on this road. Uh, the impact of initial velocity, um, that's a good point. So um, in that case, we know that the initial incision was must have been very rapid. Um, this is uh, documented by um, yeah, uh, um, radiocarbonages in fill terraces right below um, the capture point. Um, so that's why I started, or that's that's why we um, basically artificially set boundary conditions that drop within a very short time. Uh, to zero at the outlet. And from then, the model evolved over time. Um, otherwise, um, well, we know what I presented is the, the geochronological data that might support this, um, but otherwise it's difficult to constrain those velocities. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Then we have Peter that is asking if there's air, if the, um, there's large variations in the river width between the keepies um, and more graded river sections. And how would you translate that into the model? Uh, also an excellent question, which I'm unfortunately unable to answer. Um, it would be something that uh, we might look into um, as soon as we can do really field work there. Somehow this, this uh, study is still also a uh, corona study, <laughs> mostly devoid of, of field, field analysis. Um, but um, if we could translate that in the, into the model, I mean, it's it's definitely a point that might make sense. That um, you know, we have we could have both. We could have a broadening, as has been shown by by Baines, for example, that river width go up at nick points. But we might have might see also the same uh, that it narrows and by that increases shear stress and have a, a quicker retreat. I would be really interested in in studying that in in more detail. Great. Okay, um, so we have another question from Victor Baker. It's quite a long one, so I understand, Wolfgang, if you want to read it yourself, but for the benefit of the audience, um, Victor says uh, that their question relates to the temporal spatial phenomenology, phenomenology um, of fluvial geomorphology. So this was uh, pointed out by some classic papers that are listed there. Um, and the relevant point is that slope, which is independent, uh, is an independent variable uh, in the in the uh, stream power, becomes a dependent variable when one is considered a graded or regime behavior. So a related point from other classical work um, sort of involves the relative effects of the two forms of stream power, power per unit area of bed, which applies to erosion and sediment transport, versus power per unit length. Um, uh, applied to longitudinal profiles. So how does this all reconcile with current approaches to landscape evolution, um, which on a very long time scale becomes evolutionary in the frame argued more than a hundred years ago? Yeah, so if you can kind of <laughs> decipher there what the question is, that would be great. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So I'm trying to, um, that's quite some, some a lot of information in the question itself, which I'm trying to sort out. Um, uh, Victor, if you're um, happy to turn on your microphone, I don't know whether you want to perhaps um, provide a, a, a an indication as to what, what you're asking. Apologies, I know that it's difficult in these meetings. <clears throat> my question, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my question goes back to uh, fundamentals of stream power, which were originally defined by Bagnold. And Bagnold uh, uh, formulated these on principles of basic physics. These have been uh, moved into geomorphology from concepts that were being argued in the mid 1960s, largely by uh, by Luna Leopold, who uh, be, was a fan of uh, Bagnold. And the difficulty was pointed out in a classic paper by Schumann Lichty on time, space, and causality in geomorphology, which is that on <clears throat> the short time scale, uh, Newtonian mechanics 
which is basically force and resistance, that you define <clears throat> parameters such as velocity in the Manning equation or uh, discharge, which is cross-sectional area times uh, uh, average flow velocity, uh, these depend on slope uh, because the energy gradient defines the uh, hydraulic parameters. But slope is adjusted in regime behavior to sediment transport. And so uh, the graded times uh, concept is slope uh, becomes a dependent variable. This is a major difference because the equations are all assuming uh, the, the basic phenomenology that applies in Newtonian mechanics, which in, in, in an instantaneous time scale, you basically have force equal to resistance and that allows you to define velocity. Erosion is highly dependent on that, but sediment transport is actually modifying the system as it goes along. So it's continually changing through time. And that change is uh, leading toward an evolutionary phenomenology. So all of this has to do with how things actually present to us in the natural world. I'm being very philosophical about this, but th there's a fundamental issue involved in the whole thing which is a source of the, of the distinction. I, when one uses uh, things like uh, the uh, averaging out of denudation with measures like beryllium 10, one is viewing the problem in a very different way than the fundamental mechanics that are operating on the instantaneous time scale that is assumed in developing Newtonian mechanics. This is a fundamental problem in geomorphology, which was pointed out a long time ago. And uh, as not being one who has worked so much on evolutionary time scales, but has emphasized more of the uh, short-term hydraulics, I just, uh, I'm not posing this necessarily to you, but I think it's a question for the whole community. Uh, it, 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 you know, how is this affecting the way thinking is going on at present. Yeah, um, first of all, thanks uh, for this, Zoti. I mean, there are a lot of unanswered, unanswered questions that I also, um, yeah, just briefly mentioned. Like, I mean, just the <laughs> the major or the, the strong dependence of um, denudation rates as well as nickel retreat rates over observation time also something that relates to, or which has been described before also by Noah Finnegan, for example, in um, for incision rates, um, and also has some relation to the Sadler effect. Um, all that seems to be something when we integrate over, or seems to matter when we integrate over longer timescales. And um, we definitely have the issue here. Let's say what the, the thing that um, also suits in our study quite well is, Gladly, that basically the nick point retreat rates, as well as the um, basin wide denudation rates, integrate over similar time scales. So, basically, over those 18,000 years for the nick points, and from 10 to 30,000 years, basically, for the um, basin wide denudation rates. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so that was a tough question. So I think you handled that very well. Um, so um, we've got a, a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, please feel free, anybody that's on the call that they need to rush off, that's fine. But perhaps we can address these final two questions. So we've got one from Iris, which I think perhaps will be relevant for many people um, on this call today. What is the minimum resolution um, or indeed, actually, the maximum, I'll add that additional uh, point into, uh, of the DEMs needed to use these methodologies. Um, so you mentioned that it's going to become available through Topo Toolbox soon. So um, thought, and Iris basically says thought that in, you know, there might be areas where this might be limited to the application. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, I didn't mention that, actually. Uh, the DEM that we used had 25 meters resolution, so it's not super high resolved. Um, but um, it's a, um, a model distributed by the uh, state survey. Uh, so unfortunately it's not free. And so I can't, cannot distribute it. 
uh, but it's very high quality because it's downsampled uh, LiDAR DEM. And the difference is to often global DEMs is that um, nick points become much more apparent in it, whereas they are more smeared in um, the um, global DMs like COP30 or SRTM or whatever. Yeah. So, of course, the more or the higher the resolution, the better. Um, but in particular, for the um, for this um, Bayesian optimization stuff that I've been doing, that involved a lot of iterations um, and rerunning the model again and again, um, usually 500 times. And this, in my case, it took about uh, two hours for the um, to do that for the um, diverse lithology case. Um, now, if you increase the resolution a lot, that would take much longer. Good. So to conclude, I think, because we are reaching the, the end of this talk, we conclude with a $1 million question from Anne, which I think it's, from what she's saying, it's quite related with Victor Baker um, was asking before. Anne is asking you, how do you have, if you do have any suggestions about how to quantify the values in the field uh, to test your assumed parameter space and scale? Um. Yeah, I actually didn't mention that. I mean, the 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 whole range of K values, KD values, back bedrock erodibilities, for example, is something that I can say, okay, it's like that and that. Um, but of course, uh, does that relate to any mechanical properties, for example, of the rocks themselves, um, or the geomechanical properties? Um, now, first of all, the huge range of couple of orders of magnitude that we observed were observed also in other studies. Um, so for example, Garcia Castellano in his paper on outburst floods and how he determines um, these well used erodibilities from the eroded dams, which have different lithologies, uh, yeah, has a similar uh, breadth of uh, K values or erodibilities. The other thing is that recently with similar rocks that um, we find in the Wutach, and basically also uh, Jens used these rocks also, were um, um, tested in mill experiments, where aberration experiments in circular flumes uh, were conducted to see how fast basically um, these stones erode. And he also sees a very high variability over orders of magnitude in the amounts of or in the in the mass lost basically from the rock in a certain time so i think this gives us possibilities to see well what's the the variability however um there are of course still challenges um because yeah local weaknesses of the rock um for example by joints by uh, whatever um can have a significant impact on the erosion. And that's something that these simple geomechanical analysis uh, perhaps cannot capture. Okay, thank you very much. Right, well, um, we are hitting time. So if anybody does have any other questions, if they could just post them to uh, the Discord server, that'd be fantastic. And then Wolfgang can get to those in his own time over the next 24 hours or so. So please, thank you very much again. Uh, it was a fantastic talk and thank you very much for answering all of our questions, however varied. Um, and yes, thank you very much to everybody else for attending uh, and for asking some great questions. Thank you. Thanks too. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>
Okay. Sorry, you're, you're muted. We need to stop recording. Oh, yes. <laughs>